Our speaker this morning is Pastor Bayani Pastrana. He is the former owner and operator of a Kung Fu studio in the Five Animals uh, discipline. He's also a former Catholic who is now the associate pastor at the Battle Creek Tabernacle just down the road. Uh, pastor Pastrana has uh, four kids. Three of them are here today. He also is the husband of one wife. And he has been a great blessing to us so far this weekend, and we look forward to the message that you have for us today. So, Pastor Pastrana, we invite you into the pulpit of the Kalamazoo Seventh-day Adventist Church, and thank you for your ministry. Well, thank you, Pastor Taylor. It is definitely a privilege to be here, and I, I thank uh, Pastor Faraz for the invitation to be here as well. And thank you for all those that were involved with the program uh, this morning. The young man with the uh, uh, special music there, wasn't that wonderful? And uh, that was Joel, was it? And, uh, and uh, also the organist, wonderful organ there, and the ladies leading out in the song service and scripture with uh, Christine and Travis earlier on. And uh, our pianist over here, I don't know if you noticed, I was over here. Before the song, or sorry, before the prayer, and uh, he was praying as we sang the prayer song before we, we had that prayer, I almost had to think, is he playing a piano or a harp? Because he was making that thing sing almost like it was a harp. Did you notice? Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, brother. And so it's wonderful to be here. I've been at the tabernacle now since May. <clears throat> I believe it's a good move for us because... Uh, Three of our children are at the academy there, and uh, uh, they were basically homeschooled before, but uh, our older, or second oldest daughter, she wanted to head over to the academy, and it opened up. Uh, senior pastor asked me if I wanted to go there, and I said, sure. So it worked out. We had to pray about it. But uh, that worked out. Uh, previous to that, I was pastoring uh, three churches, and uh, I've been with Michigan Conference now, as I mentioned last night, about uh, 13 years, over 13 years now. And uh, it's a good conference to be with, and I just praise the Lord for the opportunity to serve in this capacity. Today we're going to be talking about something interesting that uh, you probably don't normally hear about, as you've heard my background being in the uh, martial arts. I did run a studio, that's what I did for a living. That's how I made my living. I trained basically 24-7. You can ask my wife, she trained as well for several years. That's actually where we met. And, uh, and the joke is that she twisted me on my arm, so I said, yes, I'll marry you. <laughs> but she denies that. <laughs> no, it is, it is we're in all uh, good uh, kidding aside. Um, that is where we met, and, uh, and that is where the Lord had called me um, out of. I just praise the Lord uh, for this opportunity to be with you. At this time, I invite you to uh, bow your heads once again with me as we seek the Lord in prayer once again. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you have been with us and that you have invited us into your presence. And Lord, we're just grateful that we can come worship you this wonderful Sabbath morning. And as we do, we seek your guidance by your Holy Spirit. The Lord, as you guide us, that we will understand your will in our lives and we shall understand your message for us this day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go straight right into the scripture from today in Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah 31. In the book of Isaiah, we find that this is a time when Assyria was on the rise. Assyria was conquering the different nations around them. And Israel at this time had been turning their back on God. The one thing to understand about the Israelites in times past is they did not really ever totally say, no, we don't want God. The problem with them is that they wanted to hold on to God and they wanted to hold on to other gods as well. So we find it wasn't so much that they totally uh, said no more God, no more uh, Yahweh or Jehovah. It's just that they wanted to have Jehovah mixed in with the other gods and the other cultures that they had. But at this point, God said enough was enough, and Assyria was going to come and conquer the nations, including Israel. And uh, Israel, realizing that they did not have the hold on God, they realized how weak they were. 
And they did not turn to God, decided, hey, let's turn to the Egyptians. They got the things we need for warfare. They got the chariots. They got the horses. Let's go to them. They'll help us. Isaiah 31 and verse 1 says, Woe to them. This was a message to the Israelites. Woe to them that go to Egypt for what? For help. Let me tell you one thing. You need help. There's one person you need to turn to, and that's Jesus Christ. You don't need to go to the Egyptians for help. But that's what they did. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses. Basically, in there, when it talks about staying on horses, talking about uh, basically the horses giving them the strength or giving them the help or their depending is another version. Uh, other versions would say that they would depend on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very what? Very strong. Hey, why not? Let's go to them. They are strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise and will bring evil. Talking about God now. And will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of the evildoers, against uh, the help of them that work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are what? Are men. And not God. And their horses flesh and not spirit. When the Lord shall stretch out his hand, both he that helpeth shall fall, and he that hopen, that is hopen, shall fall down. Now it's the ones that are helped. And they all shall fail together. My dear friends, I wonder if there are certain things in our own lives where instead of turning to God, we're turning to the Egyptians. I wonder if there's something in our own lives that we go, well, God cannot help me, so let me go see what the Egyptians can do for me. And that's what the Israelites did. After all, who is God to help them? Well, let's go to the Egyptians. They got the chariots. They got, to, they got the horses. Now, it's interesting. Sister White had mentioned, and you know the, the, the passage where she talks about we have nothing to fear except how that the Lord had led and taught us in the past. And that's the problem with the Egyptians. If you notice Peter in his sermon and Stephen in his sermon in the book of Acts, they reiterated Israel's history. Let's go back into the history of Israel for a moment. Let's go to Exodus chapter 14. The Israelites should have gone back to their history books. Let's go to Exodus in chapter 14. By the way, thank you to that young man who got me this drink earlier this morning. Where is he? He had a Pathfinder uniform on. He, he, there he is. What, what's your name, young man? James. James? Thank you, James. James comes up to me and says, hey, you've got to be in the back. I go, okay, but they told me I need to get a microphone. So, well, come over here. So he brought me to the AV room. And then I told him, you know what? I, I, I need a cup for my, for my uh, drink, for my water. I had some water. He brings me not only a cup, but water in it already. Thank you, James. And, uh, and so here we are in, in Exodus 14. This is a time now that the Israel, Israelites were released from Egypt. And they go there, and instead of going uh, uh, to basically straight to the promised land, the Lord leads them to the Red Sea. They are there trapped between the Red Sea and the Egyptians. You know the story. Let's look at a few things that happened. In verse 9, it says, The Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamping by the sea beside uh, Pihiroth before Baal Zephon. So here we see the Egyptians caught up to the Israelites. Israelites are trapped. Let's go through the story a little bit, and you know this. Verse 13. Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of whom? Of the Lord. Moses says, Don't worry about the Egyptians. You'll see what the Lord will do. 
which he will show you, uh, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen this day, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight. He'll do what? He'll fight for you. And you shall hold your peace. So here Moses says, don't worry about the Egyptians. God will fight for you. Now, I don't know about you, but I've learned one thing. Even though I used to run my own studio and have my apprentices, and they would teach uh, the, the people who want to learn how to defend themselves and how to fight and how to beat up people, one thing I've learned, the greatest fighter in the world is God. You can't beat God. Anyway, so he says, don't worry about it. God will fight for you. And then it goes on in verse 22. As he goes through the children, you know what happens, right? Moses puts up the staff, the, the sea opens up. Verse 22, the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. You know the story. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and horsemen. So here they are. They're walking through a dry ground. Egyptians are going after them. And so it goes on now. Verse 24, came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked up unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and to the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. Leave it to the Lord to do your fighting for you. You notice that? And took off the chariot wheels. There actually says that it gave way. Now words, they were getting stuck somewhere in the stand. And so the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. The Egyptians were getting nervous now. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come upon the Egyptians, upon the chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned in his strength. And when the war, uh, morning appeared, the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Who overthrew the Egyptians? The Lord did. And the waters returned and covered the chariots. Covered the what? Chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, there remained not so much as one of them. So what happened to the Egyptian chariots and horsemen? Destroyed by God to protect Israel. 700 years later, about 700 years later, guess what's happening? Israelites had turned their backs on God. The Assyrians are coming. So the, the Israelites said now, Hey, let's go to the who? Egyptians. They got chariots. They got horsemen. They got the horses. Israel forgot their past. God destroyed the chariots and the horses. They should have known, hey, these are useless. They would only turn to God. It's amazing today how we turn to things of Egypt to take care of us. It could be different avenues in life. It could be things in the finance. Hey, let's, let's do the lottery. That, that'll get us the money. Not the Lord's way. Let's turn to, to this type of fashion. It's not the Lord's way. I know. Let's turn to the martial arts. That will help us take care of ourselves in these last days. After all, who wants to be a martyr, right? Let me take you back to a time in history. And you know this, Revelation chapter 12. You know it very well. Actually, you know what? Save time. You know this. There was war in heaven. War began in heaven. That's where the conflict began. And it was basically, talks about Michael, Michael. We know, meaning one who is like God, versus somebody here known as Satan, the dragon himself. By the way, today's message is called Exit the Dragon. 
The whole series is called Exit the Dragon. Let's go to Isaiah for a moment. A very familiar passage for you as well. Isaiah and chapter 14. Isaiah in chapter 14 with some symbolism and cryptic message here. There is here shown as what happened with the individual who was in heaven, who was an anointed cherub. And, and Isaiah 14 and verse 12 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst waken or weaken the nations? This is Lucifer, the anointed cherub. Look what it says. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into where? Heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now get this. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like who? The most high. Who's the most high? God. You see, it, Lucifer was the highest created being there was. But here what happened was that he got proudful. And he figured, hey, I want to be higher than I am. Now, if you're already the highest creature in the whole universe, to be another type of creature, you'd actually be going down the ladder. Are you with me? Uh, the only place for him to go up is to be God himself. And so this now transpires down on earth as he was cast down and upon the creation of mankind. Go with me to Genesis chapter 3. Familiar story, we're just setting the groundwork here to understand how we came about trusting in other things other than God. In Genesis chapter 3, in the Garden of Eden, here we find the woman getting close to the forbidden tree. And then in verse 4, as she was talking to the serpent, Verse 4, it says, And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. God told them, if, if you eat of the fruit of this tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. The serpent now comes along and says, No, 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 you're not going to die. Totally against what God had said. And in verse 5, For God does know in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened as ye and ye shall be as what? As gods, knowing good and evil. By the way, the word there is Elohim, which can be translated as gods, plural, with small g, or God with a capital G. You understand that, right? It's the same word in the Hebrew. Now, I believe that that could be translated as God, capital G. You can be like God, the Most High, simply because Adam and Eve did not know other gods. But that's not the point. The point here is he's saying, you know what? You're going to be like God. You're going to be some sort of a God. And that's where we get this teaching in the occult. Whether you want to call it spiritualism, spiritism, new age, or whatever you want to call it. We get into this type of thing where now we become like God. By the way... Um, Part of the, the meeting last night was talking about how this major symbol in the martial arts is the yin-yang and the, how that now basically has a different concept of God than what the Bible teaches. And if you missed that one, uh, uh, see the recording it, see if you can get that message. One thing you'll notice about these Eastern arts that you will find is that there is, uh, including the martial arts, or especially in the martial arts, you will find uh, them uh, sitting down, cross-legged. And, uh, and I, I showed this with the school kids, and they knew exactly what I was talking about. You know, when you're going like this, we're just doing this. What's that called? What is it? See, the kids know it, okay? It's called meditation. You're meditating, okay? Well, let me share with you a few things, because there's a difference between biblical meditation and the Eastern meditation. Because you know in the Bible it does talk about meditating. Let's go for a moment to the book of Psalms. You'll see quite a bit of there in the Psalms. 
I'll just give you a few examples of meditation in the Bible. It says here in Psalm 1, verse 2, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. Okay? So meditating upon God's law. I'll give you another example. Chapter 63 in the Psalms. We'll stay in the Psalms. That way it makes it quicker for us. 63. And in verse 6. When I remember thee. Talking about God. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee. In the night watches. Talking about meditating upon God. Let's look at another one. Psalm 77. There are several more. I'm just going to use this last one. I'll show you some others later on. <clears throat> Here, Psalmist writes in 77 and verse 12, I will meditate also of all what? Thy work and talk of thy doings. And so here we find the Psalms in Scripture talks about meditating upon God's law, meditating upon God, meditating upon God's works, upon His precepts, upon His statutes, upon His word, upon many things that the Lord has done. So the Bible, when it talks about meditate, it's talking about filling your mind with God's uh, mercies and His love and who God is. So it's something that you think about as you think about all these wonderful things that God has done. So that is the biblical meditation where we actually fill the mind. Now the Eastern meditation that is used in the martial arts is basically emptying the mind. It is the opposite. So you don't, you don't fill the mind, you actually empty the mind. And the ultimate goal is to reach what is known is as the void, where you're not thinking about anything, or enlightenment, or the awakening, whatever you want to call it. So there's different things. And by the way, I've seen it, uh, that form coming into the Christian churches as well. Uh, they call it contemplative prayer, prayer, or centering prayer which is a form of it, but in the way they get you to start off is not to totally empty your mind right away, but to bring you to focus on one thing. That's why they call it centering prayer, whether it's the word Jesus, and basically, or the word Lord, or Spirit, or mercy, or love, and you just repeat it over and over. That way, your mind can be basically emptied out of any, anything of your surroundings, and you are now brought into just that one focus of that one word. My wife, when she was, before she was in Adventist, this is when she was younger, she visited uh, a friend's church, and in that church, it was a Pentecostal church, and I remember she told me about it. Here's, here's what they did. They would go, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And they kept going until you're basically, uh, I'd go nuts. I don't know about you. Okay? But, but basically, the whole idea is you, you empty out from the rest of the world, and now you're just focused in on one thing. That's the same thing in Eastern meditation, where you're emptying the mind rather than filling the mind. By the way, Matthew 6, 7, Jesus did say not to use vain repetitions in our prayer. And part of that Eastern meditation is to develop what is known as the chi, as they call it. It's that inner strength that they believe is from the center, and you try and call it out. And that is what helps you, number one, that inner strength helps you break bricks, or boards, or bones, or whatever it is. And do these supernatural things. By the way, I did used to break bricks myself. And if you look at me, I'm not that big. I remember one time, and the, the bricks we would break are patio stones. The ones that are about two inches thick. And they would be 18 by 12. And uh, I know it's not just physical. I'll tell you why. We had, uh, basically, I had this one guy. <clears throat> there was this one guy in, in our system there. He was over 200 pounds, tried to break that brick, and guess what happened? <clears throat> brick didn't break. Something broke. 
<laughs> it was his arm. As he tried to hit it, his arm broke. But then there was this young lady, 14 years old, petite, not very big at all. Very, uh, small lady, young girl. She went through it. Which tells me it's not just physical strength. And me, I'm not that big myself. I used to do demonstrations. This was back in Toronto. That's where I grew up. Uh, I would take those and I would do multiple breaking where I would take one on top of the other with quarter inch slabs at the ends. In between, I would do multiple breaking or two or three or five, however many. But I tell you one thing, I could not physically do that myself. That's where you needed to literally tap into a different power. You see, and that's where the meditation comes in. And when I would go and break through that brick, there's an instance where I don't know where I am. I don't know where my surroundings are. It's like a void. And that is the goal of that meditation where you empty the mind. And again, in the martial arts, they call it the, the chi, the one you're trying to develop, that inner strength. In, uh, they have different names for it in different types of cultures and different types of uh, uh, systems. For example, in yoga, they, they, they call it the uh, kund, uh, kundali, kundalini, sorry. Kundalini is what they call it. So different systems. By the way, when I was younger, I watched a movie called Star Wars. Guess what they called it there? The Force. And so we find here that you need these, and, and as you watch uh, different uh, martial artists, some of the things, I'll tell you right now, some of them look real phony anyway. But I tell you, the ones that really tap into the supernatural you will find that uh, there is no explanation for them. And these are things that you won't hear about when you just first join a studio. They're not going to come out and tell you these things because they're gonna, you're just going to up and run. These are things by being behind, behind closed doors and you know these things as you go up the different levels. I remember one time the, the man I was training under, and I used to call him Master, by the way, Jesus said, call no man master. I went from that master to a different master. My master used to be the dragon. My master now is the lamb. I train lamb style. You know that, right? But anyway, so here, here we, uh, I remember that man who, who, uh, who was training me and whatnot. He was, he was the master, quote, master that I was training under. I remember there, I was about to go into a meditation meditation session. And here's what he told me. He told me, be careful when you meditate very deep. Because you will find that that is when you will leave your body. And when you come back, you might find that your body is now occupied. And then you would have to fight for it back. They call it astral projection. We call it demon possession. That's meditation. It's interesting when I go to a, a church and I go to a new church district, they find out I used to teach the martial arts. One thing they tell me is, hey, pastor, why don't you start up a class here at the church? Lord have mercy. But you know, you don't have to do the meditation and all that stuff, just the physical. My dear friends, you cannot separate the meditation from the physical. You cannot separate them. Matter of fact, it is nothing less than meditation in motion. Okay, that's a nickname for Tai Chi as well. In other words, you don't have to be cross-legged, sitting down cross-legged, you know, in this position to be meditating, to be emptying the mind. What you do in the martial arts is you are now in a, a, a trance of meditation where you are just merely doing it physically. So you're still meditating, but now you're doing the movements with it. Meditation in motion, dear friends. I remember, like I said, I've, you know, I've done those breaking bricks and things. I remember one time, I, and I shared this with the, the young kids in the junior academy there just yesterday, 
Anyway, I remember one time I had, uh, I used to interview people before I accepted all my students. And so I had this one guy who was, he had to be at least six foot six, over 300 pounds. There was a classroom happening in, in the training area. And I was interviewing this man and I was doing a, a couple of demos with him. And so there was a classroom and, and I had one of my instructors teaching over there. And I remember I did not a hard type of style, but a soft type of style that they do in the martial arts. And as this man, I was doing a demo with him, and as my hands touched him, his feet picked up, picked up off the ground, and he went right across the room and almost tore that wall down. The class came running out to see what was going on. He literally levitated as I did the, the soft style with him. My dear friends, this is not something natural. This is something that you tap into in the martial arts. I'm not that big. But my dear friends, when you tap into that, and, and I'm not here to encourage it, I'm here to discourage it, because I'll tell you one thing, no matter what kind of power there is behind that, there is a power greater than that. Let me put it this way, and I pose this to the kids. If you're down, uh, walking down a dark alley late at night, would you rather somebody like me who trained in martial arts protect you, or would you rather God protect you? I say God. There was a time I would have chosen somebody like me, but I've realized that martial artists, they are only men. Just like in Isaiah, it says the, the horses, they're just flesh. The men are just flesh as well. Let me just share a couple other things here. The man I trained under, I remember one time we were, we were in a session together, and when he taught us uh, instructors and whatnot, he only taught us three or four at a time. And so I, was, I, was, uh, I went and basically flew down to where he was, and we did some training in the wilderness and all this kind of stuff. And I remember one time when we were done for the day and we were just sitting around the, the fireplace, I remember one thing um, that he showed, and there was four of us at this time. He comes up, and uh, he leans over um, to somebody, one of the other three guys. It was me and the three others. And he goes up and says, I'm going to do something. So he tells him. And then he turns to me now. I'm sitting on the couch, and he's sitting on the other end of the couch. And he tells me, keep your eye on me. Don't take your eyes off of me. And as a discipline, you don't take your eyes off something. For example, if he told me, keep an eye on, on this glass of water, I would have kept my eyes on it for, until he told me, okay, that's it. I would have gone 24 hours, 48 hours, or whatever. I would have guarded that cup. But anyway, he told me, keep your eyes on me. So I'm, I'm, I'm watching him, and all of a sudden, I'm there, I'm just looking. And it was very strange, because then all of a sudden, I'm starting to see the things that are behind him. He started disappearing in front of my eyes. And I just go there, and all of a sudden, he stopped, and he turns to the guy that he spoke to at the beginning, says, what did I say was going to happen? Well, he said, you told me that you were going to disappear in front of Bayani's eyes, which he did. And then he goes now, and he confirmed it, because I could, he did start disappearing in front of my eyes. He now leans over to somebody else. He tells him something. And then so he tells everybody now, keep your eyes on me. So all four of us now watching him. So as the four of us are watching him, in my perception, again, he, I'm like this, and I'm trying to see where he is because he is now disappearing. And all of a sudden he stops. And then he turns back to that one guy and says, what did I say was going to happen? Because, you know, me, I was kind of skeptical at the first. After all, we were, it was nighttime. We were there by the fireplace. I'm thinking, okay, you know, maybe. But anyway, that's when he says, in case you're wondering if it's 
just the fireplace or whatever. That's when he went and told the other guy what was going to happen. And so now he does it the second time. And so he asked the guy, what did I say was going to happen? And he said, this is what he said. You said that you would disappear in front of Bayani's. And I can't remember uh, who the other guy was. He says, and this other guy, you're going to disappear in front of their eyes. And he confirmed it. I said, yeah, you were disappearing. The other guy said, yeah, you were disappearing in front of my eyes. So he chose, so it wasn't just random, but he chose who he was going to manipulate. Share one more. I was there. <clears throat> he turns to me. Or actually, this was another session with the four of us. He turns to me. Again, I'm one end of the couch. He's at the other end. He turns to me and says, don't take your eyes off me. I'm looking at him. As a good martial artist, making sure he's not going to do anything funny. So I'm looking at him. All of a sudden, here's what's happening to me. All of a sudden, I'm going, <clears throat> I couldn't breathe. And so he all of a sudden goes, what's the matter? I can't breathe. You see, I thought it only happened in the movie Star Wars. But he literally, he was not touching me. He was, he stopped my breathing. And of course, he just turns around and says, oh, that's just an old Shaolin mind trick. My dear friends, that same night is when he talked to me and talked to me and said, I want to train you in spiritualism. He says, the other guys aren't ready, but you are. And it's at that same time that my wife, her brother, and his wife were praying for me. So I never got into it. But I tell you one thing. When I was, uh, when I was there and he told me that, you know what was going through my heart? I go, yes! Because I was drawn. It's like a magnet for that power, the ability to basically stop somebody dead on their tracks without even touching them. My dear friends, in a martial arts, we see the little powers that are given at a time until you get to the higher levels. Let's turn to Revelation 16. Revelation 16. Talking about the end times. Revelation 16. Here's what's happening as it talks about our day and time as things are happening. Revelation 16 and verse 13, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working what? Miracles. My dear friends, understand that as we come closer to Christ's coming, we're going to see more and more miracles. And we're not talking about miracles like, uh, uh, you know, like you see in, what's that movie with that kid, glasses? Harry Potter, okay? Uh, I'm not talking about just those, because that's one way the media is getting us. We're getting us trained to, to accept miracles and, and all these things. I remember when I was younger, it, it seemed innocent, but it's still supernatural. You know, things like bewitched. So you remember that? I dream of genie. Now it's gotten to a point that it's accepted and they got things with vampires and werewolves and all that kind of stuff now. It's the occult, dear friends. But it's, it's basically nothing more than the gathering of spiritualism. In verse 14, they are spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. My dear friends, we're coming to the close of Earth's history. We're going to see more and more of these things. But the unfortunate thing is I'm seeing more and more people drawn to the thing where God called me out of, which is the Eastern arts. You've got to come 
Today at 3.30, I'm going to talk about the physical parts as well, as far as the combative mind for the, needed for the martial arts and so on and so forth. There's more to it than this. Let's go to Revelation 14. Revelation and 14. Revelation 14 and verse 8, talking about the three angels. But look at the second angel's message. It says, And there following another angel, saying, Babylon is what? Fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Ancient Babylon, what they had there were magicians, astrologers, necromancers, all these things based on the occult and spiritualism. And now we find that these things are, uh, as it's growing, it will be exposed. Babylon is fallen, dear friends. I am telling you this day, Babylon is fallen. Do not get involved in the Eastern arts. I've been there. It is dangerous. Revelation 18 and verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is what? Fallen. Talking about spiritual Babylon. Is fallen, and it's become the habitation of what? Devils. And the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Look at this, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. My dear friends, it was not an easy thing for me to leave the Eastern arts. As I studied God's Word, the Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart. And then I was reading one thing, but then I was teaching another thing. And I was going, wait a minute, these things don't, don't blend. And I did what, the, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, you know, where the feet, I tried to mix it together like the iron and the clay, but it would not cleave one to another. So here I am with God's Word and then the Eastern philosophies tried to put them together, and you know what? They did not mix. They did not blend together. Two totally different kingdoms. And the Lord said to me, come out of Babylon. You need to serve a different master. So I was, I was serving the dragon. The Lord said, come, serve the lamb. He's your master. And as I was in darkness, God said, come into the true light, for that light has come into the world. My dear friends, as enticing as these Eastern arts are, God's people have no business in it. And I'll be talking more about that later on at 3.30 and at 6 o'clock. So come, hear more of the story. But I just praise God because there's one thing that was missing. No matter how good you become, there's one thing that is missing in this whole formula. And that is, there is no Savior in the Eastern arts. You become your own Savior. You become your own way to getting to whatever you want to call it, or as they call it. Whether it's enlightenment, or the awakening, or nirvana, or whatever it is. I just praise God that I have a Savior. Enter the Lamb. Jesus Christ is my master. Will he be your master today? And that means that what Jesus says we will do, where Jesus says to go, we will go. My dear friends, who here is glad that we can have Jesus as our master? Anybody here? I invite you to stand with me and let us pray. Maybe somebody here, you've been caught in Egypt, in the world, doing other things, but you want to say, I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I want to accept Jesus as my Savior, as my Lord, as my Master, and you want to do so through baptism. You've never given your life to that Master. You want to do so. I just invite you to raise your hand where you are. 
Raise your hand if that is your desire. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You have several people here, Pastor, who want to give their lives fully through baptism. Maybe somebody here today, you've dabbled in the Eastern arts, but hopefully today the Spirit has been working in your heart and has been speaking to you. And you realize that you need to get out. And you want to just say, Lord, help me get out. As enticing as it is, help me get out and follow you completely. If that applies to you, I invite you to raise your hand where you are. Somebody here has been dabbling. You want to come out. Come out of Babylon. And somebody here, maybe you just want to rededicate your life to the Lord today. You want to say, Lord, thank you once again for being my master. You want to say, Lord, thank you. By you, raise your hand where you are. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Loving Father, we're grateful for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came and died for us and is our Savior. Be with those that want to be baptized, seal their decision. Be with those that want freedom from the Eastern arts. And for those that want to rededicate themselves to you, bless them, Lord. We thank you for calling us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. For this we pray in Jesus' name, who we want to give ourselves holy to.